minus 17 minutes and flight. counting. Go ahead. Yeah, BFS pre-flight uplink load is complete. I copy, CVFS. CVFS copy. Dumping of the Ops 101 program stored in the memory of one of the four redundant general purpose computers is now underway. That will take about seven minutes to complete. Engineers will be examining that data for anything that would miscompare. Go ahead, PLT. Okay, horizontal fit. Yeah, scan horizontal fit config is complete, and the, uh, we verified the ohms interconnect config is also verified. Okay, copy that. Pilot Charlie Bolden has been in the process of configuring the cockpit switches for launch, and he's uh, reporting that most of that configuration is complete. The airframe engineer is checking all of the critical movable aerosurface uh, driver currents and is positioning all the hydraulic systems uh, for activation. OTC PLT, MPS helium reconfig is complete. Copy that. Uh, MPS OTC. Yes, let's go. Okay, verify 945, 946. Yes, 947? Yeah, yes, sir. Copy that. Double OS. Go ahead. Okay, configuring all the RCS cross feeds for flight. And at this time, yes. Copy. Pilot Charlie Bolden has reported that the helium system reconfiguration has been completed. This opens helium isolation valves necessary for the in-flight purges of the engines. Water levels in the water spray boilers are now being checked, and they are being verified to be sufficient for the mission. The NASA test director has asked Houston Flight to send their pre-flight uplink command to the orbiter's backup flight system. These loads are sent from the Milo tracking station here at KSC and put the fifth general purpose computer in the proper configuration for launch. Configuration of the cross-feed valves between the orbital maneuvering system and the reaction control system propellant tanks is being performed. The orbiter test conductor has asked pilot Charlie Bolden to report the quantities in the reaction control system propellant tanks. Meanwhile, the booster test conductor has been asked to start the gaseous nitrogen purge of the aft skirts. The flow of inert gas ensures that no explosive or Flammable gases can accumulate in the bottom of the solid rocket boosters prior to their ignition. We're at the point now where all non-essential personnel are being cleared from the launch danger area. The white room has been closed out for flight, and the closeout crew, closeout crew has departed back to the roadblock. T 
T-minus 12 minutes and counting, we've received word from White Sands that the weather reconnaissance aircraft there has advised that with the wind that they're seeing, there is still ample margin out there to cover any contingency in the event that we should have an abort once around. He has reported his observations to the chairman of the mission management team, Brewster Shaw, and Brewster has determined that uh, weather at White Sands is go for launch. We've also received a verification that all of the contingency support is ready and that the aircraft and emergency teams are on station to support the launch today. The T minus 20 minute dump of the Orbiter General Purpose computer memory has been completed. We have no unexpected errors in that report. Now T minus 11 minutes and counting. All personnel on channel 212 is OTC. Discontinue all non-mandatory LDB traffic for remainder of count. T minus 10 minutes and counting. About one minute now from the last plan built in hold in the STS-31 launch countdown this morning. The flow rate of the conditioned air fed into the orbiter's payload bay is being reduced and will be verified at about 180 pounds per minute, which is the figure desire for launch. by now to go into the hold at T minus nine, three, two, one, T minus nine minutes and holding for 10 minutes. We will emerge from this hold at 822 Eastern time. When the countdown resumes, the ground launch sequencer will be in control the master computer program will issue the commands to perform all of the final critical tasks required to put the vehicle in its launch configuration. During that time, it will be monitoring as many as a thousand different parameters in that last nine minutes to make sure that they do not fall out of any predetermined limits that the launch team calls red line. All personnel in firing room one have now switched over to the same communications channel and they will be staying on that through launch. Now about two minutes into 
the T minus uh, nine minute built in hold. We'll go uh, now to Mission Control in Houston for a readiness statement and also to the Space Telescope Operations Control Center at Goddard. They will report uh, their readiness going now to uh, Mission Control in Houston. This is Mission Control Houston. Flight controllers in uh, the Ficker 1 room are ready for launch. The flight director uh, for ASCAT, Von Dittemore, just polled the room and all positions reported they will be go for coming out of the T minus nine minute hold. Uh, one slight change to this morning's plans for launch. Uh, ben Guerrier will be designated as the prime transatlantic landing site with Banjul as backup uh, due to a problem with the primary TACAN system at Banjul. The secondary TACAN system is operational, uh, but uh, since weather is good at both sites, we will be choosing Ben Guerrier as the prime transatlantic landing site this morning. Uh, no other systems problems are reported, and uh, all positions in Mission Control are standing by for launch. This is Mission Control Houston. We'll hand over now to Hubble uh, Space Telescope Operations at Goddard. This is Hubble Telescope Control Greenbelt. The Director of Orbital Verification, Mike Harrington, has confirmed that all uh, control team positions here at the Space Telescope Operations Control Center in Maryland and the support team at the Huntsville Operations Support Center in Alabama are ready to support today's launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. Approximately three hours ago, the crew configured switches aboard the orbiter to provide essential power to three telescope systems. The telescope's receivers were powered to ensure that they are warm and on frequency to receive initial commands from the control center following launch. Heaters for the rate sensing units were powered to maintain the gyros at a stable temperature and power was applied to the fixed head star tracker shutters to ensure that they remain closed during launch. Otherwise, the telescope is essentially powered down in Discovery's cargo bay and ready for launch. Beginning approximately four and a half hours after launch, controllers here will begin sending commands to systematically activate the telescope systems in preparation for tomorrow's scheduled deployment. Again, all is ready here in the control center at Goddard Space Flight Center, Greenbelt, Maryland, and at the support center at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, for today's launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. At T minus nine minutes and holding, this is Hubble Telescope Control Greenbelt returning now to the Launch Control Center. This is Shuttle Launch Control in firing room one of the Launch Control Center at KSC, where we have approximately five minutes remaining in the T minus nine minute built in hold. Several milestones remain between now and launch. As we come out of the hold, the ground launch sequencer will take over control and issue commands for the final critical task and monitor the hundreds of vehicle measurements that are coming in during the final nine minutes. At T minus seven minutes, 30 seconds, the orbiter access arm retraction will be performed. And at T minus five minutes, pilot Charlie Bolden will start up the orbiter's auxiliary power units. A gimbal check of the orbiter's aerosurfaces will occur at T minus three minutes, 55 seconds and switch over to internal power occurs at T minus three minutes, 30 seconds. And then the orbiter's main engines will be gimbaled or, or moved at the T minus three minute, 25 second mark. LOX tank pressurization and retraction of the GOX vent hood will start at T minus two minutes, 55 seconds. And the liquid hydrogen tank will be pressurized for flight at T minus one minute, 57 seconds.
Okay, well, we're at the risk of being repetitious. We're here again, and uh, everything looks good. Shuttle, ground systems, and the Hubble. And we believe the universe is still go. So uh, we hope we can get you up there to take a look at it today. Have a good one. Okay, we sure do thank you very much. Uh, looks like it's been a good countdown here. Yes, sir, and uh, NTD, you have go to proceed. I understand, thank you. Flight, IFL, RPF, NTD. This flight. IFL. This is IFL. JRPS. JRPS. Okay, step 1012, you can activate recorders. Copy. That's DVD OTC. This DVD, go ahead. Yeah, we have a pinnacle bay purge rate since the launch of this time. At the time, we just completed it. Uh, it's stable at 178. Copy that. With it not performed on step uh, 1009. Copy that. Entity flight uh, recorders have been activated. I copy. Countdown clock will start in two minutes. I feel that you copy that the recorders are active. NTD, CNFC. Go ahead, CNFC. Yeah, we heard the uh, change in uh, tail, tail sights to 118 actually. Uh, that's firm. And we're now Ben, ben Greer. And uh, they change those tail wheels yet? That, that's firm. One minute and 30 seconds from taking up the countdown at T minus nine, where we will press on toward the handoff of the ground launch sequencer to Discovery. The onboard computers will then start their own automatic sequence, and the final commands will come at T minus 10 seconds to provide the concurrence for a go for main engine start. The engine start will occur at T minus 6.6 .6 seconds and solid rocket booster ignition at T zero. The orbiter's computers will issue the commands to start and the ground launch sequencer will concur. 45 seconds now to picking up the countdown. Thirty seconds away from picking up at T minus nine. Nothing is reported amiss, and we are go for picking up the count in ten seconds. Hands on clock will resume on my mark. Five, four, three, two, one, mark. Sequence now into the final phase of this morning's launch countdown with the initiation of the ground launch sequencer. Standing by now for a request from the orbiter test conductor to Houston flight to send stored program commands, which are the final update on the antenna alignment. Next significant event coming very shortly here with the orbiter crew axis arm being retracted away from the vehicle into the launch configuration. This arm can be re-extended in less than half a minute if that's necessary. T minus seven minutes, 30 seconds and counting. Yeah, go for orbiter access arm retract.
In about 45 seconds, the orbiter test conductor will give pilot Charlie Bolden a go to perform the auxiliary power unit pre-start. Bolden will configure switches in the cockpit to put the APUs in the ready-to-start configuration. The APUs will be started at T minus five minutes. Go for APU pre-start will come in about 10 seconds. You want to start your APU on your fifth chart recorders, please. Recorder started. PLT OTC. Go ahead. You can perform your APU pre start, please. That, that's in work. The APUs provide hydraulic power to the orbiter. Standing by for confirmation that the APU pre start is complete. Pre start is complete. Three great talkbacks. Thank you, Charlie. Pilot Bolden reporting back that the pre-start operations are complete. T minus five minutes, 30 seconds. Mission Control has transmitted the signal to start the flight recorders. The two recorders will collect measurements of the shuttle system's performance during the flight for playback later after the vehicle is in orbit. May upon T minus five minutes and counting. Let's go for orbiter APU start. And we have a go for APU start. APU, please. That's in work, Stanley. And CDR or TC. Go ahead. You can reconfigure heaters, please. Commander Schreiber asked to reconfigure the orbiter heaters. He'll report uh, when that's complete. Ground launch sequencer has terminated liquid oxygen replenished to the external tank and is now initiating the LOX drain back. NOTC, PLT, APU, APU start is complete and yeah, so far so good. There are the good words. Three APUs in good health. About to start a profile test. Profile test of the orbiter's aero surfaces. The orbiter flight control surfaces are being moved through a pre programmed pattern. And we'll have a gimbling of the main engines, which will follow. Final purge sequence of the main engines is in work. We're now transferring to internal power and switching off the orbiter's ground power supply. At this point, Discovery is being powered by the onboard fuel cells. T minus three minutes and counting. Go for pressurizing the external tank. All systems are BLT go for launch. OTC, two one two. Go ahead, OTC. Okay, clear caution and warning memory and verify no unexpected errors. Okay, we have no uh, caution and warning annunciation stand. Okay. That's complete. Thanks, Charlie. Standing by now, here is the retraction of the gaseous oxygen vent hood. The gimbling of the main engines is complete, and the aerosurfaces have been verified that they are positioned for launch. The external tank now is reported to be at flight pressure. OTC, 212, close and lock your 
your visors and initiate your O2 flow, and you all have a good trip. Roger that, Dan Lord. Let's just go for ET LH2 pressurization. Bringing the LH2 pressurization up to flight levels. 90 seconds away from launch now. One minute, 30 seconds. And the LH2 tank now reported at flight pressure. Both tanks, liquid and oxygen now, ready to flow propellants. Sound suppression water system is now being armed, which will flow water onto the mobile launcher platform at the rate of 900,000 gallons a minute, beginning at T minus 16 seconds. The, heater, the uh, heaters on the booster joints are now being turned off. The orbiter computers have positioned the vent doors to the launch configuration. Standing by now for a go for auto sequence start. T minus 33. Clock will hold at 31 seconds due to failure. We've had a hold. We do not know at this time what the problem is. We'll be standing by for a word, but the clock is holding at T minus 31 seconds due to a system failure. And NTDSD, it's the LO2 outboard filling drain valve. NTD is the MPL. Go ahead. It's uh, LCC MPS8. And uh, PV-9 outboard zone drain closed power is off. It should be on. A recommendation? And uh, NTD, that we're in a no-go situation. We should have uh, our open power, and we do not. Or excuse me, our, our closed power. SP. And uh, MPS, can we verify that the valve is closed? Negative. We are right now show a open position. We cannot verify the valve is closed. SP, this is MPS. Go MPS. Okay, we'll let LCC read now. If we have the closed power on and the open position off, we can uh, cycle one time and try to pick up the closed position, but uh, we never picked up the closed power. Okay, and MPS, uh, we have a message that we were blocked by a prerequisite sequence, GCL-18. What has happened is the ground launch sequencer would not hand off to the orbiter's computers to complete the count because the liquid oxygen fill and drain valve was showing off when it should be on. analysis of the problem has begun. Uh, we've been holding two minutes. SB, this is uh, CMPS. We're going to make an attempt to pressure that valve closed. So we've got the pre set off. If this works, we should be in good shape. I copy. Proceed. It work. We have seven minutes of runtime available on the auxiliary power units. We've been holding now about two minutes and 20 seconds. There's the confirmation that we have successfully okay, and, uh, you're in the recycled. We are go for start. Booster hydraulic power units have started. Sound suppression water system has started. T minus 13 seconds. T minus 10, go for main engine start. We are go for main engine start. T minus 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. Mission Control Houston.
Roger roll, Discovery. The roll maneuver puts the vehicle in the proper launch plane. Guidance officer confirms a good roll maneuver. Engines now throttling back. The throttle down maneuver assists in reducing the aerodynamic loads on Discovery as it passes through the area of not maximum dynamic pressure. Velocity now 1,200 feet per second. Discovery downrange three nautical miles. Discovery, go and throttle up. All three engines now throttle back up. Go and throttle up. Engines at 104 percent. The go at throttle up call signifies that all systems are performing well. All three auxiliary power units look good. Discovery's velocity now 2,300 feet per second and is downrange 8 nautical miles. Standing by for SRB separation. And both solid rocket boosters have separated. Discovery's velocity now 4,300 feet per second at a downrange distance of 35 nautical miles. Booster officer reports all three engines stable at 104% performance. Discover Houston, performance is nominal. And Discovery, two-engine Ben Gurrier. The two-engine Ben Gurrier call means that uh, Discovery could reach the transatlantic abort site at Ben Gurrier on two engines if it were necessary. Copy, nominal performance, two-engine Ben. Velocity now 5,000 feet per second. Discovery 60 nautical miles away from the launch site. All systems continuing to perform well aboard Discovery. Velocity now is 6,200 feet per second. Downrange 100 nautical miles. The uh, environmental systems officer reports the FES is operating well. That is the flash evaporator system that provides cooling to Discovery systems. Discovery Houston, negative return, press to ATO, select Banjul. Negative return, press to ATO. That last call means that Discovery cannot return to the launch site at Kennedy. However, uh, enough energy uh, has been achieved to reach a safe orbit on two engines should one shut down. And uh, Discovery could also reach the backup transatlantic abort site at Banjul if that were necessary. All three engines are stable at 104%. Auxiliary power units all performing well. Discovery's velocity is 8,400 feet per second at a downrange distance of 175 nautical miles.
Discovery, Presto Mico. Presto Mico. The Presto Mico call signifies that Discovery could make the main engine cutoff target. Discovery, Droop Banjo 109. Group 109. And that last call means that uh, Discovery could reach the Banjul Transatlantic site on one engine at 109%. All three engines still looking good. Discovery's velocity, 12,000 feet per second. Downrange, 290 nautical miles at an altitude of 60 nautical miles. Guidance officer confirms that navigation is good. Discovery, single engine Banjul 104. Single engine Banjul 104. Booster officer reports uh, all three engines stable. Houston, single engine press 104. The single engine press call means that uh, Discovery could make it to main engine cutoff targets on one engine at 104%. Discovery's velocity now 16,000 feet per second, at an altitude of 58 nautical miles, downrange 435 nautical miles. Discovery, late call, single engine press 104. Roger. Fuel pH, we expect it. Discover Houston, concur. No action on fuel cell pH. No action is required. No impact on that uh, pH message. That uh, message was expected during this phase of the launch. Velocity now 19,000 uh, feet per second. Three engines throttling back now to maintain the 3G limits on the uh, vehicle. Discovery is 580 miles away from Kennedy at an altitude of 56 nautical miles. We are standing by for main engine cutoff at uh, 8 minutes 32 seconds, mission elapsed time. Good week, uh, looks uh, nominal from here. And the booster officer also confirms a, a nominal main engine cutoff. Discovery, we see ETSEP. Nominal Miko, Ohms 1 is not required. The booster officer has also Roger confirmed. No Ohms 1 required. This is Mission Control. The booster officer confirms a good separation from the external tank, and the flight dynamics officer confirms good performance on both uh, phases of the ascent. No uh, orbital maneuvering, maneuvering systems one burn is required.
Discovery Houston, for info, we've had some problems out of White Sands, but we anticipate a nominal handover to Tedris at 11 plus 30. And uh, Houston, we copy, and uh, we had left uh, L3A fell off uh, during the plus five second uh, dump. Roger that, Discovery. We see it. No action for you now. We're still evaluating. This is Mission Control. The uh, Ground Control Officer uh, does not expect any uh, loss of communications capability with the crew. We will be handing over to uh, the tracking data relay satellite uh, at about 11 and a half minutes uh, mission elapsed time. There have been uh, some minor problems at the White Sands ground station, but uh, they expect no particular impact from that. Booster Officer reports that uh, we see data indicating the main propulsion system dump is in progress. This uh, procedure uh, uh, vents any remaining uh, fuel or gases that may have uh, resided in the engines uh, at the end of their burn, uh, just to make sure that those uh, gases are vented out of the system and uh, not present any problems for the remainder of the mission. Discovery uh, Houston. Discovery, we're standing by. Go ahead. Now to that alarm, we're back with you through Tedris. Expect nominal ohms two. Anticipated delta V four nine or five. Okay, we copy and standing by on your go for APU shutdown. Now to that discovery, stand by. Discovery Houston, go for APU shutdown. Roger. This is Mission Control. The crew uh, has received the go to shut down the auxiliary power units. And uh, they've been informed also that the uh, normal orbital maneuvering systems to burn uh, will be done on time, which is uh, scheduled for 42 minutes, 39 seconds mission elapsed time. Change in velocity will be 495 feet per second, and that burn will uh, put Discovery in uh, an orbit of 330 by 310 nautical miles.
This is Mission Control. Mechanical Systems Officer reports that the APU shutdown was normal, that uh, the procedure looked good, and the configuration of the uh, auxiliary power units looks good. This is Mission Control. The MAX officer uh, reports uh, indications that the uh, external tank doors are closing aboard Discovery. Crew is uh, right on time following through the uh, post insertion timeline or the post ascent checklist. And uh, at about 50 minutes mission elapsed time, uh, just short of an hour, they will uh, begin uh, procedures in the post insertion timeline. Max officer confirms that the external tank doors are closed and latched.
Discover Houston, while you're on the way to Attitude, if you've got a uh, spare moment, we'd appreciate a debris report. Okay, Steve, stand by one. Houston Discovery uh, for debris on the way uphill, right in the about from uh, a minute and a half to two, Charlie and I noticed uh, several uh, flecks of things uh, impacted the forward windscreen. They seem to be pretty soft and uh, just leave little streaks. SRB SEP uh, put a pretty good uh, little cloud on all the windows. And uh, here at uh, Vacuum and Earning Terminate, uh, we see lots of uh, ice particles, but uh, that's all normal. And between SRB SIP and uh, Mika, we didn't really see that much debris uh, that we can recall. Okay, roger that, Discovery. Appreciate the report. This is Mission Control, and Guidance Officer uh, has reported that uh, Discovery has uh, almost completed the maneuver to the uh, position for the orbital maneuvering systems to burn. That burn is uh, scheduled about 16 minutes from now at 42 minutes mission elapsed time. 
and that uh, ohms burn will have a change in velocity of 495 feet per second and will raise uh, the low point of Discovery's uh, orbit to 310 nautical miles. Discovery Houston, we see you in burn attitude and your targets look good. Roger that, Houston. Roger that, Lauren. We copy, and uh, about how far away do you think it is? On the uh, long axis, that would probably be about a six or seven mil uh, radius on the coax. Roger that. Thank you very much.
This is Mission Control. The uh, guidance officer uh, has seen the uh, data indicating that Discovery is in the proper position for the uh, Ohms 2 burn. And uh, Commander Lauren Shriver was discussing with uh, Capcom Steve Oswald that the crew could see the external tank below them uh, on its way to the impact area. Uh, Discovery, are you still with us? That's affirmative, Discovery. You're loud and clear. Okay, as we've been coasting here, we've just been watching the external tank uh, tumble, I don't know, four or five times uh, since we called you last. Roger that. Must be a beautiful view.
Discovery Houston with some words on your burn. Go ahead. Roger, Lauren, since we lost uh, L3A, if you should lose an engine during the OMS-2 burn, an OMS engine, we want you to terminate the burn at an HP of 85. Okay, we copy. This is Mission Control. That uh, last note given to the crew refers to uh, the uh, small uh, reaction control jet number L3A, which bailed off uh, uh, shortly after uh, the uh, ascent phase was completed. Uh, propulsion officer thinks that they, that was a, due to a valve failure, perhaps in the uh, oxygen valve uh, system of that small RCS jet. Uh, therefore, the crew has just been given a little note to change their procedure card. If during the upcoming uh, orbital maneuvering systems to burn, they should have an ohms engine failure, they would uh, terminate the burn at uh, an altitude, uh, perigee altitude of uh, 85 nautical miles uh, in order to give flight controllers time to uh, assess the situation and see what action should be taken at that point. We'll be coming up uh, in about two and a half minutes on the uh, time of ignition for the uh, Ohms 2 burn. Once again, that's at 42 minutes, uh, 36 seconds mission elapsed time. Delta velocity for the burn is 495 feet per second. Uh, should raise the perigee of Discovery's orbit or the low point of uh, Discovery's orbit to 310 nautical miles resulting in a final orbit of 330 by 310 nautical miles. This is Mission Control.